Hey guys, what is up? Super K-Man Rocks here, and I am here for my 2024 LCS Spring Split Playoff Primer video. I'm very excited to get into this. I know this video is coming out a couple of days, maybe not a couple of days late in terms of the schedule, but man, we've had a lot of League of Legends crossing over at the end of March here, and unfortunately just didn't get time to make this video before the first day of the playoffs. And so as you guys are watching this, either the first series is still on or it, it's probably over. Over. Um, I have not seen anything. This is all being recorded before that series ends up being played. And so I don't know what's going on. Some of these takes are almost immediately going to either age well or poorly. Try to cut me at least a little bit of slack when it comes to the 100 Thieves Cloud 9 series in the comments. But today what we're going to be doing is going over everything from the end of year awards to the all pro teams to our first round playoff matchups. And I will also be giving a playoff bracket uh, prediction at the end of this video as well. So everything that has to do with the playoffs is going to be covered with the end of the season in the LCS is going to be covered in this video. If you guys are excited, let me know down in the comment section below. These are going to be more of the obviously opinion oriented videos that I put out, whereas like the game reviews are a little bit more objective and who played well and who did not play well. So let me know if your opinion differs drastically from mine down in the comments. Would love to know what you think. Of course, what we're going to be doing in today's video is going over, uh, first, of course, the awards, the main awards, the MVP, the rookie of the split for me in spring of 2024. We'll then be going over all three of my all pro teams. And trust me, they're going to have some surprises on it because I just think that this year was very crazy and all honestly very difficult to narrow that list down on. And then we will be going over all of the first round matchups as well as the other two teams that are in losers bracket giving you guys predictions on what I think might happen as the playoffs continue along but I don't want to waste too much time we've got a lot of good stuff to talk about in today's video so without further ado let's jump right into it we're going to be starting it off with the major awards the two big ones the MVP and the rookie of the split and why don't we start big why don't we go for the biggest one at the start so for me coming in as my 2024 LCS spring split MVP it is going to be Quid, the mid laner, 400 Thieves. I just realistically couldn't give it to Jojo Pune. I do think this was a bit of a two-horse race in the top, uh, or I guess in the mid, uh, if you will, with these two positions, but Quid very much solidified his spot as number one in that ranking to me based on his performance in the final week of the season. I think it was neck and neck between him and Jojo, and Jojo also played really well, but Cloud9 had a few more problems. He wasn't quite as good in that second game, and Quid, I think, kind of pushed himself over the top because of that, so he is going to get my spring split in MVP and talk about a, a shocking MVP in the LCS in particular. I think it's been a while since we've had somebody win this award that was this surprising to win it, in my opinion, from the beginning of the year. Obviously, I was low on Quid before he ever came to LCS. I'm somebody who watches LCK challengers. I talk about that on the channel a lot. And so I got to see a lot of Quid on Gen G in terms of his challengers run. And he was interesting, super mechanically talented, but kind of just funneled in every single game. That team didn't really have any talent around him. And so they were bad and they they just knew that they could play through quit they could give him every bit of resource they could give him every single bit of experience and, and try to win through him every single game and they weren't really able to do that but his performances individually were very good which is what attracted 100 thieves and so I was interested to see if that was going to be translated to the LCS now in year one it didn't because the structure of the team around him was basically the opposite of what he had on gen G you have this team where you're coming in with double lift and closer and these are two very high resource players in two other roles and quid took a very low resource role on that team for 100 Thieves last year, and it's just not what he's good at. He needs to be strong side. That's really kind of the mid laner that he is. He needs to be getting constant resources from his jungle in order for him to play as aggressively as he wanted. So he was bad last year. He wasn't comfortable didn't feel like he fit into the team, but you look at his 2024, and here we are. Like, this is the quid that uh, not even was promised, but the, the best version of what you could have expected from him. I don't think anybody thought he was going to come in and be an MVP this year. For him to be as good as he was, and for 100 Thieves in general, to overperform and be as good as they have been, it's huge for them. They're the number two seed going into the playoffs, and quid has truly been exceptional this split. Very deserving, in my opinion, but like I said, the runner-up, if you will, the, the main honorable mention here is Jojo Pugh in the mid laner for Cloud9. That team has struggled in this super year for them, but if there's 
there's one player that has been a constant, that has stabilized that team, that has been really the only player to consistently game in and game out, make a difference in a positive way for them, it's been JoJo. What an amazing pickup. He's continued his MVP trajectory. Uh, unfortunately, not able to go back-to-back, -back, in my opinion here, because I think Quid was just a little bit better, but JoJo is still amazing. And honestly, this is kind of a big two in the LCS right now. It's awesome that we get this matchup in the first round of the playoffs, because I'm incredibly excited to see how it ends up going down in a best of five, but JoJo continued to be great. And then the other honorable mention might surprise some people. It's going to be Whippo for me in the top lane. I thought he was really good this split, was constantly winning lane, actually was taking over games in the mid to late game, and honestly got a lot of resources from FlyQuest. He was a pivotal member of what that team was doing. In my opinion, the best player on that team. Now, if you want to flip out Whippo here for Jensen, I think that's realistic. Jensen would be my number four, but I don't think anybody outside of those top four for me were ever really in consideration for MVP. It was really a, you know, it was a top two and then three and four, and then everybody else was just kind of there. Uh, Quid and JoJo were definitely the two front runners, though, as far as I was concerned. But credit to Whippo, credit to Jensen. FlyQuest is the number one seed for a reason. And mostly, to me, it's because those solo laners were so good this split. But again, credit to Quid. He was amazing for 100 Thieves this year. And, you know, an MVP is certainly not what I expected. But that's my MVP. It's time to move into my rookie of the split. This one was significantly easier. There really wasn't a race for this one. This was kind of a, a one-horse race, if you will, because my spring 2024 rookie of the split in the LCS is going to be Sniper, the top laner for 100 Thieves. 100 Thieves clean sweeping the big awards here so far, but uh, this one really was not difficult for me. Sniper was easily the best rookie in the spring split. As you can see, the honorable mentions, XU, Meech, you know, his teammate, they were both really good, and Meech in particular was really good on weak side. XU had a couple of really good games, even if he struggled at the beginning of the split. He really found his footing as the split continued onward, and especially as an initiator and engager. It was positive, but Sniper was just a game changer in the top lane. For 100 Thieves, actively winning them games, being really good in lane, being a dangerously great split pusher. And that was something that, you know, really, it really impressed me is that he actually pulled a lot of attention. His macro skills were a lot more developed than they were last year in the spring in the NACL. And so you're just happy to see the growth and development from a player that I don't think a lot of people expected to dominate and run away with this award. I know I didn't. Off name pedigree, you would have, because, you know, we've been talking about Sniper since he was, what, like 12, 13, 14 years old when he reached rank one challenger in North America, and, you know, he's just kind of made his way up to the LCS off of that. He hasn't necessarily been the most dominant top laner in competitive when he has played at lower levels, but it's crazy. I, I think the best he has ever looked and the most confident he has ever looked is his first split in the LCS. You have to give a lot of credit to the 100 Thieves coaching staff because they deserve it. I mean, this split was amazing and obviously they've gotten the most out of their players, but give credit to Sniper for continuing to evolve and grow his game and not just rest on his mechanics that I think a lot of people were touting him for in the first place. He's really grown the mental and the macro side of the game, which I think has really unlocked him and, and that's why he's getting rookie of the split. If he was just winning lane a little bit and transitioning that into being fine in the mid to late game and you know not necessarily winning games for his team like on his own with his play, Plays, then he probably wouldn't be rookie of the split. And honestly, 100 Thieves probably wouldn't be the number two seed without that. So, you know, Sniper was incredibly important. Like I said, XU also was getting better as the year went on. I really liked how he was playing down the stretch. I think some of the engagers that he plays are really, really good for him. I think the Rel, you know, the Sejuani, like that kind of style, it's definitely helped out Dig to solidify some of their mid game playing for bot lane has really helped out their identity. And I think XU is a really big part of that. His tempo and his pathing has gotten significantly better. Better, and he definitely deserves an honorable mention for me. And then Meech, Sniper's teammate on 100 Thieves. I did not think he was going to be the best rookie bot laner, in my opinion, this split, but to me, he was. You know, I love Masu, but I thought Meech was better. Uh, I certainly thought he did a bit more in terms of low resources. I thought Masu was fine in most games, but didn't necessarily make any game-breaking like wins or losses. Meech was that guy. Even with low resources on champions like Senna playing weak side, he still was able to affect the game in a pretty major way and be a, a pretty big difference maker. So those are going to be my two honorable mentions, but Sniper's going to be getting my rookie of the split. Quid is going to be getting my MVP, 100 Thieves, sweeping the major awards, and maybe that bodes well for their playoff run. But now moving on to our secondary awards or our all pro awards. We've still got some things to cover and this is the part of the video that I think is going to be probably the most controversial. People usually don't get too upset about any playoff predictions that I make and you know all pros are definitely going to be a little bit more up in the air but especially for this LCS split because holy crap were some positions almost impossible to fill out three all pro members for even one for some of these positions like 80 carries like 
I, I don't know, man. Like, any of the eight, like, literally in any order, it's crazy just how volatile some of these roles were to try and select from. So, you know, hopefully listen to what I have to say, and if you still disagree immensely, you know, let me know down in the comments, but... Let's get right into it. I don't want to waste you guys' time on this video too much. Let's start with my first Team All Pro for Spring of 2024, and it's up on the screen. And I think that there's really only one here, or maybe two, that I really don't feel great about putting in my first Team All Pro. I think top side is very clear to me. Top lane, jungle, mid lane. They all felt very easy for me to select as the first team, but bot lane is going to be difficult throughout this entire segment because I just don't think that bot lanes were all that good in the LCS in 2024 so far, in my opinion. But let's go ahead and go over it. My first team all pro does consist of Whippo from FlyQuest in the top lane, Inspired from FlyQuest in the jungle, Quid, obviously from 100 Thieves in the mid lane, Tomo from Dignitas in the bot lane, and Busio from FlyQuest in the support position. So some, some easy takes here. We'll start with the easy ones. Uh, Quid in the mid lane, already talked about him at length. A great player that's been very well-rounded can play those melee assassins, can dominate with resources, but has also been really good on Talia. In fact, you could maybe argue that Talia has been his best champion over the course of this split, which doesn't necessarily play into his playstyle, but I actually think the player that I compare Quid to, and this might be kind of a weird thing to say, but playstyle-wise is Xiaohu, and maybe not like current Xiaohu, because he's not playing super well in the LPL right now, but I'm talking like Prime you know, 2018, 2019, 2020 Xiaohu, uh, where he plays a lot of these roamers, a lot of these champions who want to be out on the map and, you know, shoving and roaming and making a difference, but he does it in a way where it's very high resource. He wants to be the carry on things like Talia. I think Quid and Xiaohu are actually a very good comparison in terms of playstyle, and that's why Quid was the MVP. When you have a split that really goes very well, in my opinion, you know, that's the kind of player that can really pop off in a way that other playstyles might not be able to pop off in such a, a, an advanced way. So, credit to Quid, we've already talked about him, but uh, Bwipo is going to be my first team All-Pro top laner. To me, it was very clear he was the best top laner. This one was by far the easiest position to give a first team All-Pro to. You know, we'll talk about second and third team. I think they're more up in the air in terms of where you might want to put some people, but Bwipo, to me, was very clearly the best top laner in the LCS, was dominating lane, was doing a really good job of transitioning those leads into something else, and honestly just added a spark to top lane that other players didn't have. We saw a lot of people picking up on meta decisions and just overall playstyle habits that he brought into the league in the early weeks, so wanted to give him a lot of credit with that. Inspired is going to be my first team all-pro jungler. He didn't get a lot of player of the games or a lot of player, you know, of the, you know, like, my channel player of the games either. However, I do think he was incredibly valuable and influential towards what FlyQuest was doing all split long. You know, I've always been a pretty big Inspired fan. I've talked about it a lot on this channel. I think he's been maybe not underrated, but like every single place that this guy has gone, he's been one of the best players in every league that he's played in. And you just have to give him a lot of credit for that. He was awesome in the jungle. We knew he was going to be awesome in the jungle, but to me, very clearly the best jungler in the region this split. But then we get to the bot lane, and this is where it gets a lot more controversial. Tomo is going to be my first team all pro bot laner. Do I want to do this? No. I, I don't think in 90% of years, Tomo, in the performance that he gave in spring, would would be an all pro, let alone a first team all pro. Last year, if we went back to spring of last year, I was sitting here like, how can I possibly, you know, keep off one of these AD carries? You know, it's so many of them are playing well. It's Berserker and it's Prince and it's Double Lift who was having a great split. And then you're leaving off FBI. And like, there were so many players that were just really good in this role. I feel like the opposite has become the case in 2024, where it's like impossible to find any AD carry that I feel comfortable even putting on the all pro list to begin with. So Tomo for being the centralizing force of Dignitas that they could play through and, you know, really kind of dominate lane with, that makes him the best AD carry in the league, at least in my opinion, the most valuable. So he's going to get first team all pro. But again, if you want to argue this, you got to give me who you think would replace him in the first team. I don't think Tomo's a first team all pro caliber player, but none of that matters if none of the other AD carries are also not first team caliber players. So it just kind of is what it is. And I kind of feel a similar way about support. Busio is going to get it for me, although I think Busio was significantly better than someone like Tomo this year. Uh, Busio did create a lot of action. He was a big playmaker for this team. I was actually doubting whether or not he was going to be a, a game breaker. I, I guess you could say a big playmaker, a big kind of influencing factor for FlyQuest going into the year because I didn't love his year on 100 Thieves as much as some other people did, but he has been really good. He uh, has assimilated into kind of the idea of let's just play for mid game that FlyQuest wants to have, and we'll talk about that a bit more later when we get into the team analysis, but 
You know, the bot lane struggled in lane for Fly. I don't really think it was because of him. He was moving around the map a lot, creating a lot of action. He is a very, very good support player into me. He was the best and at least the most consistent in the league. So that's my first team All-Pro. And then it's time to move into my second team All-Pro here for Spring. Uh, again, once we get to second team, it does start to get a little bit more iffy. And you're going to see that. And definitely there's going to be at least one or two controversial opinions on this second team. But for me, my second team All-Pro is Impact from Team Liquid in the top lane. Blabber from Cloud9 in the jungle. Joe Jojo Pune from Cloud9 in the mid lane, Yawn from Team Liquid in the bot lane, and Huhi from Energy in the support position. We'll talk about the Cloud9 boys first because I think they're going to jump out. Uh, Jojo's a no-brainer. I mean, he's the he, the only reason he's second team is because Quid is in the same position as him in first team, so it is what it is. Jojo was the second best player in the league, and unfortunately, that means he gets popped down to second team All-Pro. I already talked about him a lot. Again, he was the primary driving force for basically everything Cloud9 did in the split this season. It's unfair that you can have someone like Tomo in first team and JoJo has to be in second team because mid lane is so deep right now in the LCS and bot lane is so shallow right now in the LCS. But it is what it is. We already talked about JoJo at length. The one that might surprise you of the Cloud9 players is Blabber because I have been talking about how JoJo was like the centralizing force and kind of did everything for C9 and... You know, I think that's kind of true for some of the games, but people are forgetting that their early runs and even their late run, like their three-game winning streak down the back half of the split, like Blabber played out of his mind, was super good in those games. He was really bad in some of the other ones, but at least in the LCS for me, that's more valuable in the regular season. If you're going to actively win two, three, or four games for your team, even if you're going to lose one, two, three of those, I still see that as a valuable split. So he's going to get second team. There's another jungler that's on my third team that absolutely could be second team. If you disagree with Blabber being here and you want to put him down into third team and you think it's absurd that I put him above, you know, the other jungler that's going to be on this list, then go for it. I'm not going to fight that battle. I'm not going to die on that hill. I think it's a perfectly reasonable thing to say that Blabber should be lower. I just value the winning plays that he made, even if he offered significantly more losing plays than the other jungler. But those are the two Cloud9 players. And there's two Team Liquid players on this list. Impact is probably not going to get a lot of debate. Very good in lane this split, which is super out of career norms for him. Typically speaking, Impact is the kind kind of player who is pretty bad in lane, is not generating early leads, is kind of getting outplayed by a lot of the other top laners, but is so consistent in the mid to late game team fights that he ends up being super valuable as a top laner anyways. That's what he was for FlyQuest last year, and it's what he was for Evil Geniuses for all those years he was on that team. But here for Team Liquid, it's kind of flipped around. He's been a great laner and a pretty good team fighter, still has been a good team fighter. I think it's gotten a little bit worse, but the upgrade into his laning phase and his ability to be aggressive in the early game has honestly made him a better player to me than what he was on FlyQuest last year, which is why he's going to get second team All-Pro. He was the best player on Team Liquid, but his teammate Yawn is also going to make this list. Again, very similar to what I talked about with Blabber. A lot of people might remember the bad games from Yawn, but he won just as many, if not more games for Team Liquid than any other AD carry did for their team in the league. They played through him a lot, especially on late game hyperscalers. That was really a strategy that Team Liquid wanted to end up going towards towards the end of the year, and they looked a lot better when Yawn was the primary focus for them. So, because of that, that makes him the second most valuable AD carry in the league. I still think his laning phase is so good that you can get away with putting him on things like Smolder and Zeri and, you know, Jinx and things like that because you know that he's still going to be competitive in the laning phase, and it kind of helps mask how poor he is once you get out of lane. I like Yon a lot more, I would say, than probably your average analyst, and I thought he actually had a pretty good split. Him and Impact were definitely the strengths of Team Liquid throughout this year, in my opinion. And then Huki for Energy. I know that it was a rough end to the split for Energy, and trust me, we will talk about that. We will get to that, because there's reason to be scared about this team, but Huki was awesome for most of this split. When you think back to the first half, he was a first-team All-Pro, and it wasn't close. Like, he was dominating games. He was the best player on energy. When this team was winning, he was the one that was driving them forward. And so I do want to take that into account and give him second team, especially with a more shallow support pool, in my opinion, a more shallow bot lane pool, in my opinion. I think who he honestly has a case to be first team, if only for how good he was at the beginning of the split. I did have to knock him because he wasn't as good down the stretch. The second half wasn't as consistent. So Busio ended up jumping him for first team all pro, but who he was incredibly good for energy. And I think it would be a shame if he wasn't in one of the top two teams with just how how valuable he was for this team the entirety of the split but that's that's my second team it's time to get into my third team the final team here and it's up on the screen now this one's going to be a little bit easier these are all the players that I think definitely deserve to be an all pro but just didn't necessarily have enough firepower or juice to make the top uh top two teams if you will so 
Let's go ahead and talk about it. It's going to be Sniper from 100 Thieves in the top lane, my rookie of the split. River from 100 Thieves in the jungle. Jensen from FlyQuest in the mid lane. FBI from Energy in the bot lane. And Isles from Dignitas in the support position. You know, we'll start with the 100 Thieves boys on the top side. Sniper, this was easy. I already talked about him again a lot in the rookie of the split kind of section. He's a really good player. I mean, he really started to take over towards the back half of the split. The early part of the split definitely had some more ups and downs, which is why he ends up falling behind impact. I do think, again, that's reasonable to say that Sniper could or should be second team. I think that I wouldn't really argue too much if that was your, you know, conversation, if that's kind of the direction you wanted to go in. If you thought Sniper was more valuable because he won more games actively for his team than impact did, I would agree with that. I would agree with that sentiment at least, but I also think that he was significantly more inconsistent and impact I thought was generally very good. So whatever you want to say here, I thought Sniper was for sure an all pro, but to me, he comes in at third team. And then River, I think basically everybody's going to have him higher up on their all pro teams than I do above players like Blabber for sure because of the amount of games that Blabber just wasn't very good in. But I also think that River was maybe a little bit overhyped in terms of the actual presence that he had on the map. He was good in the early game, but he wasn't actually taking over and generating these massive leads, you want to give a lot of credit to the laners for actually being able to win 1v1. Now, River deserves credit for allowing those laners to feel comfortable in those 1v1s to take some of these early trades, specifically on the top side of the map with Sniper, with Quid. You don't have as good of a split if you don't have River here, but there weren't a lot of games where River was actively getting his own resources or really even getting resources for Quid. He was just more so allowing Quid and Sniper to get their own resources and, you know, controlling the objectives and being more of that secondary facilitating player. I think Blabber's games were more, Blabber's good games were more impressive, which is why I put him on second team All-Pro, but River was significantly more consistent. That's why I said I'm not willing to die on this hill. If you want River in the top two all-pro teams, go ahead and put him there. I'm I'm really not that pressed about it, even though I do have him down here at three. But Jensen's going to be the mid laner here. I really want to put him higher. Again, he was a top four player in the league for me, but Quid and JoJo very clearly occupy those top two spots in all-pro. So Jensen gets third team. What a career bounce back year. He was up and down for Dig, but I was actually high on his Dig year. I thought he developed a lot over the course of last year. He's always been a little bit more of a slow player, somebody who who doesn't like heavy resources in the mid lane. I thought he got better at that when he was playing for Dig, especially down the stretch. That's why they were able to get top six last year, but... It's really just unlocked here on FlyQuest. He's gotten back to his comfort play style of playing control mages and playing a little bit more facilitative, and I think it's just helped the team out a lot. He more than deserves an all-pro spot. And then in the bot lane, I've got FBI here as the uh, the third all-pro bot laner. I don't feel good about this. Again, Bevoy off of this list definitely feels bad, and I think a lot of people are going to want Bevoy because I do think there were a lot of times where he felt like the best bot laner, but you know, Shopify also wasn't very good. They didn't really play through him, and even if he was winning isolated in 1v1s, his team fighting still wasn't perfect and, and left a little bit to be desired. That adding on to the fact that he didn't play the whole split definitely means that, you know, he was knocked a little bit in terms of my rankings, which is why I gave it to FBI, but again, there's almost any combination of AD carries that you could have in the all-pro teams that I would be okay with. Berserker was never even in conversation for my all-pro list, and, you know, he's Berserker, but I, I think he had a really bad split, so you know, there's just a lot of other options if you want to go in that direction. Meech was pretty solid. You know, I think Masu wasn't really all that bad if you really wanted to make an argument for him to be on an all-pro team. There are players that I think you could make the argument for, but I ended up going with FBI because, again, I do think the bot lane for energy was by far the best part of the team, and I do think that they won a lot of games for them at the beginning of the year, but for me... I just, I just couldn't figure out who I wanted to put in third team. I'm not, again, not, another hill I'm not willing to die on is whatever AD carry you want to put on this list, but... Then we get our third team support, and it's going to be Isles. Again, Dignitas' bot lane was actually really good in comparison to the rest of the league for a lot of this year. They won super consistently isolated in the 2v2, and honestly, I was very impressed with how Isles was as a playmaker in the mid-game throughout the back half of the year. To me, very clearly a choice for third team. Uh, other options here include, I don't know, Vulcan, maybe? Like, he had a couple of good games, a couple of really bad games. He was like Blabber, but on steroids, like, his bad games were significantly worse than Blabber, in my opinion, so I didn't really, like, seriously consider consider him for this. I think you could put Ayla in this spot. I think that's definitely reasonable and definitely something I considered, but I actually, I wanted to give a lot of credit to Dignitas' bot lane because there weren't a lot of teams that really played through bot in the way that Dig did, and they were able to get to the playoffs because of it. I mean, I know they were below 500, but th they're not even close to 500 if it's not for that bot lane. So, Isles is going to get that third team, but those are my all-pro teams. Again, let me know what you agree with or disagree with down in the comment section below. I know these feel very weird, and they feel like they honestly should be wrong, but I don't know. I, I You know, like, it, it was very difficult. This was the hardest all pro that I ever had to do for one of these videos. So let me know what you agree with or disagree with down below. But it's time to move into my actual team analysis. We're going to start with some of the teams that 
you know, are maybe not playing in round one, are, are on the lower side of the bracket, your five, your six seed, that kind of thing. And then we will work our way up to the matchups that we're talking about with the top four. But it's time to get into the actual playoff analysis that now that we're done with the regular season. But that means we get to move on now to our team analysis section. And of course, like I said earlier, we're going to be starting with the teams that aren't in a uh, upper bracket series, at least yet. The five and the six seeds. And we're going to start from the bottom and work our way up. And that means we get to talk about the number six seed, the team that lost the tiebreaker at the end of the season. It's energy. And honestly, if you would have told me they were going to be entering the lower bracket even a couple of weeks ago in the playoffs, I would have been relatively surprised. This team's collapsed. Down the stretch has been well documented, but certainly something that is worth taking note of. They do a lot of things right, but they do a lot of things wrong, and they certainly have dropped off in terms of the consistency of their mechanical play over the last few weeks, which I think has really cost them a lot of spots in terms of my confidence. So let's go ahead and talk about what they are and what I expect from them going into the playoffs. Your lineup is obviously Dokla in the top lane, Contracts in the jungle, Palafox in the mid lane, FBI, Eddie D. Carey, and Huhi at support. This should be one of the best teams in the league. There is absolutely no reason for this to be a bottom, you know, three or four team in the league like they've been playing recently. They have not been good. They went 0-3 in the final week of the season. And even their 2-0 week before that in week two was dubious to say the least. I, I think there are real concerns without with how energy play the game. And I think a lot of it revolves around the idea that some of their players are just really bad in lane right now and they don't really generate a lot of individual leads. Their goal difference, their gold difference, I should say, is fine, but a lot of that is bot lane. Like, especially when you look at stats, it's FBI and Huhi doing really well in a lot of their early lanes and Palafox, you know, generally being okay or, or being a little bit more hit or miss, a little bit more volatile, but the top side of the map has been a problem. Dokla has not been good so far in 2024. He's been a below average top laner, absolutely for sure, and you know, you would really hope that that's not going to continue. That's very atypical for what Dokla has been over the course of his career. At the very least, even when he was starting off on Optic and, you know, all those teams back in the day, he was a good laner. He just couldn't translate it into much. Now it's just not there. Like, he is having the worst split of his career, especially since coming back to the LCS. And you really have to hope that that skid is going to stop because in his current state, again, I can't say this enough, it's just been bad League of Legends from the top side of RNG. Contracts, I think, has also gotten worse. I don't really know what what's going on, it, and it's kind of the opposite of contracts, right? When you think of contracts, when you think of how he's played the game over the course of his long career, it's been this feast or famine style. He's going to lead the league in deaths, but he's also going to have a ridiculous amount of pressure on the map, and oftentimes you will take that because his mechanics are just good enough to be able to pull plays off like that, but it's really not been that, especially down the stretch for energy. He's been very passive, he's been playing very scared, and I think it's really cost this team a lot of games. I don't really know what's going on in the coaching room. Obviously, this team fired a lot of coaches. They, you know, cut down their staff considerably, but it's been a problem. Like, this team has been significantly less proactive in the early game, and for contracts especially, a lot of that comes into the form of objectives, giving over a lot of the void grubs, giving over dragons in the early game, trying to fight for objectives in the mid game when you're already down a ridiculous amount of gold, just taking bad fights, not having good macro, not making good in-game decisions. That's been the problem for energy, and I think a lot of that does fall on contracts, but it's not just him. Palafox was the worst player in the league in the final week of the season. When this team went 0-3, he was getting demolished in every single game that he played, including the tiebreaker. It just wasn't good. There's nothing really comforting about how he played the game. And, you know, obviously you have to hope that he's going to be able to get back to where he was, even at the beginning of the split where he was doing relatively well, especially on Assassins. You could put him on something comfortable that, you know, obviously he's always been more of the Assassin player of the LCS. Every single region seems to have one of these guys that likes to play your melee Assassins, your Zekka role, or your Closer, or your, you know, Cream, or, or whoever you want to, you know, say is the influence for that style. Like, Palafox is that version for the LCS, but he's kind of gotten away from that as well so far in 2024, and it's hurt him. It's not gone well, so that's a real concern. I think if you're looking for the stabilizing presence on this team, it's been the bot lane who has easily been the best part, but Huhi, I think, was a little bit worse in week number six. FBI has just kind of been the same player throughout the entirety of this year. He's going to win some games for the team when Huhi and when contracts are creating opportunities for him. He's good enough to be able to win games for you, but he's not going to be able to generate his own leads, or at least he hasn't done that so far this year, especially because this team puts him on weak side so much. He's just so good in the isolated 2v2 early on that he is able to generate small advantages, but when Huhi is on, that's when this team wins. That has kind of been the case. Even though Dokla and Contracts have been pretty bad for most of the split, when Huhi is able to create opportunities for the rest of this team, Palafox is good enough that even from behind, he's going to be able to take advantage of it. And FBI is a really good carry when he has those resources. So that's going to be the part that you're going to be looking at for energy. But 
there's a real opportunity for this team to be one and done. Like, out in the first round of the playoffs, they have no, you know, lifeline here. I, obviously, they're going to be playing the loser of the Cloud9 100 Thieves series, which is going to be a difficult matchup, basically, no matter who that ends up being. And so you're looking at a situation where energy is just not particularly favorited in any of those. And that's why I think some people actually do surprisingly have confidence in this team, because energy always has done their best work when their back is up against the wall, when they are considered the underdog. I think they are definitely going to be considered the underdogs in the playoffs this year, but a lot of that is due to their own accord. I would expect this team to be a first round out. That would be my anticipation just because of the way that they have played. They're going into the playoffs with the least amount of confidence possible, but if any team is going to thrive off of that opportunity, off of the negativity and the lack of confidence surrounding them by the media right now, it's probably going to be this one. Hopefully they can at the very least make things interesting and show some of the good things that they not only showed last year, obviously, but that they even showed at the beginning of the split before they fell off. And then moving on to our other lower bracket team here that isn't going to be getting a winner's round one matchup. It's the team that won the tiebreaker against Energy and is overperforming expectations by being here in the first place. It's Dignitas coming in as the number five seed. For them to be the number five seed is actually pretty impressive, and I think they did it in a way that does make me feel relatively confident about this team, specifically with how they played towards the back half of the split. They are actually looking maybe like the fourth best team in the league. I think there's a real like question as to whether or not they are better than a team like Team Liquid up in the winner's bracket with how they have played recently, most specifically because they have a lane that I feel very confident about in the bot lane. I don't think they're stars, but I honestly do think these players are very good, and they've been great in the small sample size that is the spring split regular season so far, so really a lot to like about that. You have to assume that topside is going to be fine in the playoffs, but... We'll talk about that now. Let's get into the actual conversation here. Their lineup is looking like Rich in the top lane, XU in the jungle, Dove in the mid lane, Tomo at 80 carry, and Isles at support. There is a lot to like. And like I said, we'll start with the bot lane because we've already talked about these players in the all pro section. Tomo to me was the best AD carry in terms of performance in the LCS in 2024 so far. He has been a focal point, a driving factor for what Dignitas has been able to do. And I do not think they are even remotely close to the 5C without how Tomo has played. He's very aggressive as an AD carry, not someone like FBI that we just talked about that's going to be waiting for his opportunities to come to him. FBI is a good laner, but Tomo is a scary laner. You do not want to make mistakes against Tomo because if he starts to get the ball rolling, he's going to push that tempo. He's going to push that advantage harder than a lot of other AD carries will. Now, sometimes that does get him into trouble because... While he is aggressive, and while he is good, he's not the most mechanically talented AD carry in the entire region. There are going to be some ADCs where if you press them, if you try and, you know, push them and play really aggro into them, they're going to play aggro back, and, you know, he's not going to win every single one of those. However, there are other teams and AD carries that are going to get scared. They're going to play a lot more passive on the bot side of the map, and Dig can just get a ridiculous amount of advantages because of that. So Tomo, I think, is the biggest positive for this team and the reason that you would be excited about them going into the playoffs. Isles obviously helps that a lot. He's always been a very good support, even going back to his Oceania days, obviously coming over to Cloud9. Never really got a fair shake of things because he was never given a real opportunity in the LCS, but was always a very good academy player and then, you know, didn't really get a chance to play in the NACL last year because of visa issues, but gets this Dignitas spot and has been very good in upper half support in the league. He was third team all pro for me, was very good in terms of performance. Now, maybe he's not quite as dominant as what Tomo is. He does match that aggressive style, but he actually is a very good roamer. That's something that Isles has always been known for, and I would expect him to continue that. I worry about this team maybe starting to index a little bit too more into uh, enchanters. I don't think Isles is a particularly good enchanter player. He's definitely more of an engaged guy that wants to get around the map. Nautilus, Rakan, those kinds of things have always been his bread and butter, but Tomo and Isles are the reason to be excited about Dignitas and the reason that they're here in the first place. They're always winning in lane, and there's a big reason why they have the highest dragon percentage in the league. It's because this team loves to play through the bottom side of the map. But then you get, you know, further up, and there are more question marks. Dove in the mid lane is fine. He's about what you would expect from a whatever import. Like, I, I really tore into this signing in the offseason because it just didn't feel like it needed to happen. And Dove has been better than I anticipated. He's not been horrid, but... Again, I still don't think he's justified being a big import in that spot. At best, he has been able to survive in the mid lane. He's not really winning lane. He's just kind of going even and being relatively neutral for this team, which is fine. It's going to help them win games, but, you know, he's not a difference maker. He's he's certainly not proven to be a difference maker. He really hasn't been a difference maker at any point in his career, and that's kind of just who he is. A really passive, not, you know, a weak side mid laner who's just going to survive at best. Sometimes he loses... 
sometimes he survives. He doesn't really ever win. He's fine, but, you know, you're not really getting excited about that. And then um, he's probably the least exciting member on the team, though, because you talk about the top side. Rich is obviously someone you would expect to be doing better than what he has been so far in 2024. Not that he's been bad, but just he was really good last year, actively being the player to carry Dignitas into playoffs. In 2023, he's been a little bit more of that weak side top laner so far because this team has indexed so much into the bot lane, but... You know, his laning has always been the concern. If teams, you know, invest into the top side of the map, if they go into a team like Team Liquid and they give a lot of resources to someone like Impact, that could be a bit of a problem for Dig. But so long as Rich is just allowed to side lane and be fine in the early laning phase, he's going to be super valuable and super reliable as a late game team fighter. That's always been his strength. And, you know, that's kind of what Dignitas wants to play for. And then a lot of this is going to come around to Exu, who has been much better towards the back half of the split, but has definitely shown some rookie concerns that young... Uh, uh, inexperienced, unproven concern uh, that he is just not going to be the most consistent jungler in the world. He's had some really bad games. He was dud of the week in one of the weeks in the LCS this year, but he's also had some really good games and he's been able to really develop as an engager. And that's definitely the style that I would expect this team to go towards. I think if you're looking at positives, the aggressiveness, the early game tempo, and the, the clear play style, I think is definitely a positive for Dig. But at the same time, predictability can also be a concern. This team has played basically the same style for three straight weeks. And that's probably what they're going to play in the playoffs as well. I wouldn't expect them to change it up because it does work for a lot of those players. And I also think mechanics are just a little bit on the downside for this team. Tomo and Isles aren't exactly the most mechanically talented players. Their mentality does a lot of the heavy lifting for why they're able to win in laning phase, and it's not like Dove or Rich are particularly strong laners. XU is not great in the early game when he has to skirmish constantly. It's just not the style that he plays. So if another team comes out and presses Dignitas and, you know, really tries to take advantage of them in the early game, those are the games that I just would not expect Dig to be able to win. But they have enough firepower to upset teams that are relatively slow, which, lucky for them, is a lot of teams in the LCS right now who play more controlled, who play more of that you know, slow oriented style. I think Dig actually has some reasonable ability to upset some teams and potentially win a series if everything goes right for them. But that's going to do it for the two teams that do not have an upper bracket round one matchup to talk about already. It's time to move into our matchups, our previews for what to expect from round number one, at least the upper bracket of it here in the LCS. And we're going to kick it off with our 2-3 matchup that is happening. Uh, it starts in about 10 minutes as I have started recording this. And so again, I don't have any spoilers. You guys either will see this as the series is going on or after the series is already done, depending on how much time I have to edit this over the course of today. But um, we'll see if this age as well or not. It's 100 Thieves, the two seed taking on the three seeded Cloud9. And I really am excited about this. This is like my dream round one matchup because Quid versus JoJo is the matchup we all want to see in a best of five. And to guarantee it here in round number one, I think is definitely exciting. But there's a lot to like about both of these teams. 100 Thieves lineup is obviously Sniper in the top lane, River in the jungle, Quid in the mid lane, Meech at AD carry, and Ayla at support. And Cloud9's lineup is Fudge in the top lane, Blabber in the jungle, JoJo Pune in the mid lane, Berserker at AD carry, and Vulcan at support. Again, a lot to like from both of these teams, but on paper, Cloud9 is the best roster that, in my opinion, we've ever had in North America. The fact that they have underperformed, gone 8-6 and six in the regular season, has been a disappointment, but 100 Thieves overperforming I think has been really exciting to see. All of these players have gotten better as the year has gone along. Obviously, we've talked about Quib to a, a large extent, both in the MVP section and, of course, in the All-Pro section. Him versus JoJo, you know, I don't want to pin this entire matchup on one series or one lane or anything like that, but this is going to be the pivot point. I mean, at the end of the day, if Quinn is the better player and is able to get super ahead and carry games, 100 Thieves is not going to lose this series. If JoJo is the better player and is able to shut down Quinn, is able to get his own advantages and win like he's been doing a lot of this year, then Cloud9's not going to lose this series. It is kind of the pivot point for both of these teams, whether or not they're going to be able to play through their star mid laner, and that's where it really comes down to, do we think Quinn can hold up? Because JoJo, I feel very confident, is going to be good in the playoffs. I would be shocked, like a genuinely stunned if teams just completely take him out of the game, destroy Cloud9 through the other lanes and just make him useless. And, you know, he plays bad. The mechanics fall off. He's never been the kind of player that I've worried about crumbling under the lights. And uh, Quid has never been under the lights. This is somebody who is really getting his first taste of big time playoff action now. If he underperforms, if he's not able to be as good as JoJo, even if he's just fine and JoJo's able to take over games, that's going to be a bit of a problem for 100 Thieves because they don't have a lot of other 
other ways to win the game, or at least that's what they've shown. Sniper is obviously your secondary win condition. 400 Thieves as we go into the playoffs here, but Fudge is a very good player, and typically speaking, Fudge does get better as you get into the playoffs. Obviously, Worlds, uh, you know, Internationals, a bit of a different story, but Fudge has really been very good for Cloud9 in a lot of their playoff runs, so even if he hasn't been all that elite throughout this year, this is going to be the biggest test for Sniper in his first ever split in the LCS as well. If you're looking for reasons to like 100 Thieves, though, River is so collected and he's so experienced at this level that you would hope that he could stabilize a lot of the comms, a lot of the decision making that's going to happen and, and going to come down with 100 Thieves here. But there is real concern that, you know, if River's your one player that you can count on to do well, Blabber's also been a player that over the course of his career has gotten significantly better when the games matter more in the playoffs. And so, you know, let's say River's good, but let's say Blabber's better. Well, now Cloud Nine's at a much better advantage for that too. You also have to expect that Berserker and Vulcan are going to be better than Meech and Ayla, even though they absolutely were not in the regular season. Berserker is just another player that you have to imagine was mentally taking some games off. It was so out of the career norm how he played for a lot of the regular season that you have to imagine that going into playoffs, it's going to get better. But what is the common trend from everything I've just said? It's all projection. It's all expectation that Cloud9 is going to be different than what they've shown in the regular season. If we're just talking about the performances that we've gotten in the regular season, 100 Thieves has a much clearer play style. They are much cleaner in terms of how their games are played, and they're much more aggressive in the early game to allow themselves to get big leads, which has always been Cloud9's weakness. Teams pressing them with mechanical advantages, trying to steal away a, you know, 2, 3, 5k gold lead before 10 to 15 minutes into the game, and you know, that's a real concern. I think as long as 100 Thieves actually execute and play on their style, there's a very real chance that they could win this series, but that's all, again, assuming Cloud9 doesn't level up and get a little bit more locked in and these players don't start to play a bit better when we get into the playoffs, which I think is a very reasonable expectation. It's going to be a really interesting and fun series to watch, but to me, this is the biggest pivot of the playoffs. If 100 Thieves is able to come out and perform the way that they did in the regular season and win this series, even if it's close, that's going to immediately change the picture for who could win the LCS finals. That makes 100 Thieves the contender right there. Not saying they aren't going into playoffs, but that solidifies the they are for real. However, if Cloud9 come out and completely change how they played, if they start to play more aggressive, start to lean into that mechanical difference a little bit more, play a lot more clean now that the games matter more, now that, you're, now that your season's on the line, that MSI is on the line, if that happens for Cloud9, that's going to also pivot a lot of the discussion towards Cloud9 absolutely is the best team in the LCS and they were just coasting in the regular season. This is going to be a ridiculously important matchup for how the rest of the playoffs end up shaping out, and I'm really excited to see where it goes with the two top front runners for MVP. And then moving on to our second round one, winner's round one series. This one, while the first one we talked about 2-3, I expect to be close. I expect to be fun. This one, I don't think is going to be nearly as difficult to predict. It's the number one seeded FlyQuest taking on the number four seeded Team Liquid. And obviously, you don't want to count any teams out or anything like that. And I'm not giving predictions right now. I'll be doing that when I do my full bracket prediction in just a moment at the end of the video, the last slide of the video. But for FlyQuest, you have to imagine that they're going to consider themselves pretty big favorites going into a series like this with how Liquid has played. This team has looked very inconsistent and there is a very clear case that across the board you probably have better players in almost every single role with how things have been over the last couple of weeks. For TL, at least they're starting to find their play style. In the final week of the season, they started moving towards these hyperscalers on the bottom side of the map with APA playing Ziggs and Asol and the champions he's comfortable on throwing Yawn on Smolder and on Aphelios and on Jinx and on Senna and you know, that definitely helps out a lot more while putting impact on Renekton and Umpty on Volibear on the top side of the map. They did it twice over the back half of the split and it really worked for them so perhaps they're figuring something out as we head into the important series but Let's talk about these teams. The lineups for both for FlyQuest, the lineup is looking like Whippo in the top lane, Inspired in the jungle, Jensen in the mid lane, Masu at AD carry, and Busio at support. And for Liquid, the lineup is looking like Impact in the top lane, Umti in the jungle, APA in the mid lane, Yawn at AD carry, and Core JJ at support. Uh, there is reason to be interested in what Team Liquid could potentially do, but of course, the big matchup in this series is going to be Whippo and Impact on the top side. I think both of them being so aggressive and both of them being so integral in terms of winning towards their team's success is actually going to influence this series a lot. Whippo is not afraid to make really aggressive and really risky plays, but Impact is the kind of player that can punish that. And so, as much as I would like to say that, you know, oh, Inspired has a huge advantage over Umpty and Jensen has a huge advantage over APA, and I would expect, you know, the bot lane to be, even if it's Team Liquid favored, not by much. 
and honestly, it's probably closer to a push than anything else. I think top lane is going to determine more. I think if Impact is able to generate a lot of leads for Liquid on the top side of the map, I think this series does change dramatically because then you don't have your primary carry that you were able to rely on even without resources for most of this year in Whippo in the top lane, and things get significantly more impactful for Jensen and Masu in particular, and if you want to rely on that, that's great. I still think it's possible for Jensen to be able to outplay Impact and be the best player in the series and carry FlyQuest across the finish line, but, you know, if Whippo is in this series, if he's winning top lane matchups, if Impact is taken out for Liquid, I don't think it's going to be particularly close. That's why I think top lane is going to be the pivot role, the pivot matchup in this series, the matchup of the series, if you will, but we can talk about the rest of these matchups inspired into Umpty. To me, this is a no-brainer. Umpty is the jungler in the LCS that relies the most on having early game pressure, on being able to go into the mid-game with an advantage because he is so bad at playing from a disadvantageous state. He either gets really passive and does nothing, or he overextends and ends up dying for absolutely no reason. Most of the time, at the very least, it's the former, but he's really a completely different player when he has a lead versus when he doesn't have a lead. He's always been like that. That was the scouting report on him. In the LCK as well, he would have one, two, three, four series a year where he would just pop off and absolutely obliterate a team because he was so consistent at getting those early game leads. But then in the other, you know, 15 series that he would play, he would just get he would be useless. He would be a below average jungler. And that's unfortunately what he has been to me so far in the LCS. I think he's been average to below average. I mean, he really hasn't done anything for this Liquid team and Inspired has been the most active and most pressing jungle in the league. I think this matchup is super FlyQuest favored in the jungle. And I think it definitely plays into Umpty's weaknesses rather than his strengths, which does concern me. And then in the mid lane, APA has also not been particularly good to me. He was better last year. I know a lot of people are going to say he was always overhyped and it was just situation with Pioshik that made him better, but I think APA individually in lane has taken some strides back. I also think that his proactivity in the mid game has gone down. I don't know if it's fear. I don't know if it's just him letting the memes get to him. Like, I don't know what it is, but playing things like Talia were really big for this team last year, and he's just not really been able to do that. He is a late game carry now at this point. He wants to play something that doesn't have to do too much in the early and mid game, can just scale into the team fighting stage where he is relatively good. He's a good team fighter. He knows when to split push in a lot of circumstances. He's very good at pulling pressure and surviving in those situations, but his laning is weak, and Jensen has been a little bit more willing to take advantage of that. We've seen what he can do with, you know, his signature picks, but he is a little bit more limited in terms of play style as well. I think that, you know, both of these players are going to be very similar in terms of they both have the way that they want to play the game and the way they want to execute on it. I still would expect Jensen to be better because he's more mechanically talented than APA is at this point at the very least, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw mid lane start to scale and APA actually be relevant in a lot of team fights in the back half of this game if that's the direction Fly wants to go. And again, if they pressure mid a lot, that could be a problem for Liquid, but um, I think if you're looking for a way that Liquid could win this series outside of Impact just winning in the top side, Yawn is somebody that they've been able to play through, putting him on Smolder, putting him on these late game hyper carries. It's been a positive strategy because his laning phase is so good, and I actually would expect Liquid to be the better laning bot lane here because Yawn is the best laner of these four uh, in the bot lane, but you have to imagine that the top side is going to influence this bot lane a lot. Even if Team Liquid is going into some of these mid game with advantages, like if Umpty and APA are just out of the game, Inspired and Jensen can then put a lot of pressure into shutting down the bot lane. And that's not even adding to the fact that Core JJ has been noticeably regressing over the course of this year mechanically. Again, we don't know what's going on in terms of comms, in terms of mental, in terms of communication when it comes to Core, but at least in terms of the active plays he's making, specifically on like Nautilus and, you know, Recon and some of these more flashy engagers, they're just not as good anymore. The plays aren't as good and it's really affecting this team and so it really for Liquid you gotta hope the Yawn and Impact are good they can win this series it's not entirely impossible but it's really gonna rely on Impact and Yawn the players that kind of got them here in the first place and then for FlyQuest you just have to play your style if you do the things that you did in the regular season you're gonna be able to win this series you know full stop even though Liquid beat you in the final week of the, of the season you have to imagine they're going into this with more confidence than they did in that game and they're going to be favorites to walk out of this round one for a reason all right, but that is going to do it for my analysis of all of the teams, all of the matchups. It's time to get into my predictive bracket here for the playoffs here in the spring split. Very excited to get into this. I love doing this every year. Again, I can't reiterate enough. I think game one of Cloud 900 Thieves is going on as we speak here. I've seen none of it. It is not on my screen. I am not on Twitter as I am making this video. And so I'm going to do my best to try and predict this. I will be giving matchup analysis for where it is applicable, kind of talking about why I'm making the decisions I'm making. But by the end of this, you're going to see who I predict to be the winner of the LCS in the spring split of 2024. And also the two teams that I predict to be going to MSI from the the LCS. Making finals is a big deal. So 
Let's jump right into it, starting, of course, with FlyQuest versus Team Liquid. We already previewed this series a little bit, and if it wasn't clear from the way that I talked about it in the previous segment, I have FlyQuest winning this. I just would be really surprised if they weren't the more talented team. I think Whippo is one of the few top laners that can actually get to Impact and take advantage of some of his laning mistakes, and I think Whippo has honestly been better out of lane than Impact has, and outside of that, I really don't think Team Liquid has a lot of advantages. Maybe Yawn can pop off on Smolder or something like that, but I would expect it to get banned out for a lot of this series, and I don't expect APA to be very comfortable in it. So FlyQuest moving on for me into the winner's finals, a pretty important series. But then we've got the other round one series, 100 Thieves versus Cloud9. This one to me is significantly closer. I would be shocked if this was a blowout. I just really wouldn't see that happening for 100 Thieves. I think they're at least going to fight, but Cloud9 should be able to win this. They should be the better team. I know they haven't played like the better team in the regular season, but we have to imagine that they're going to figure something out. I think Cloud9 should be able to win this. I'm going to put it at 3-2. I think it could be, I didn't do the FlyQuest TL. I think that should be a 3-0. I don't think TL should actually be able to win a game there. Uh, but I, I'm going to put this at 3-2 with 3-1 as the other possibility. I think Cloud9 should, you know, be favorites here, but not by as much as I would say FlyQuest. FlyQuest is 3-0, 3-1. If you guys are unfamiliar, I like to give a predictive and then like a range, right? Like, so, you know, a 3-1 matters for C9, but it's different if I think it's like a 3-1 closer to a 3-2 or a 3-1 closer to a 3-0. You get it. Like, you get how it works. I think this is a 3-2 that is closer to a 3-1 in favor of C9, and I would expect them to be able to win this, but 100 Thieves, if they won it, I wouldn't be entirely surprised, if, especially if, like, the rest of Cloud9 really continues to underperform. I would expect this to be more uh, up to Cloud9, whether or not they actually play up to their standard, rather than if 100 Thieves, you know, play up to theirs, so... And then we've got the lower bracket here. It is uh, the sixth seed against the loser of 2-3. That's how this works, at least that's how it showed on the... The graphic that they put out and so in my bracket here I've got energy taking on hundred thieves and to me this is another relatively easy one to predict I would imagine hundred thieves should be the better team here again maybe some energy voodoo magic ends up happening and maybe this team ends up getting better as we head into playoffs but at least as of now these two teams are not on similar playing fields hundred thieves should definitely be better especially with how they played recently quid is the best player in this series but if palafox can pop off if the bot lane plays well I mean both of them kind of known for some playoff heroics FBI and who that is and if Dokla can get, like, back to even remotely what he was last year. Energy's more talented than 100 Thieves. They can absolutely win this series. I have it 100 Thieves 3-1 or 3-2. I think they should be favorited in the way that they played by a considerable margin, but Energy absolutely could win this. I'm going to give them more of a shot than maybe some other analysts would. And then in my second bottom, you know, uh, or losers bracket round one series, Dignitas taking on Team Liquid, and maybe in a bit of an upset, I've got Dignitas winning this. I think Team Liquid is just not built to win best of fives. In fact, I think this team is really going to struggle in best of fives because they have a very clear play style that I think will be relatively easy to ban out. And I think the one thing the TL has struggled with the most over the course of this split has been pressure coming in from the enemy team, especially in the early game. If Umpty gets behind XU, if, if we get, you know, the bot lane for Dignitas getting really strong, which I think is very reasonable as happened in week six, I think they're going to win that series. I have a dig 3-2 uh, with TL 3-2 was kind of the other outcome. I think TL absolutely could win this series. They're more talented than Dignitas, but play style wise, I think Dig actually has a better shot to win this series than, than Team Liquid does. Maybe that's an upset. I don't really know. How do you guys feel about that? But then we get to the upper bracket, and this is really the series, right? The winner of this auto qualifies for MSI. They make their way to the final, so a big one between FlyQuest and Cloud9. I've got FlyQuest winning this, and I know that sounds crazy, but I just, I, I have to see it with my eyes for Cloud9. FlyQuest is going to be the team that's moving on from winner's finals into the grand finals here for me. Cloud9's still alive. They go down into the lower bracket, as you can see, but I would expect FlyQuest to be able to take this first series at the very least. They just have a more complete roster at this moment. It's going to be Fly 3-2, C9 3-2, that's going to be my spread. I really don't see any reason to go anything else. This is going to be the most important matchup that everybody's looking forward to, in my opinion. Maybe if 100 Thieves can beat Cloud9, all of a sudden it becomes FlyQuest versus 100 Thieves. But to me, you know, FlyQuest should be an interesting team, and they should be a team that should make finals here. Um, then you've got 100 Thieves versus Dignitas. I've got 100 Thieves going ahead in this one. They progress earlier on in this bracket because, you know, they are playing teams that I think they should be able to beat. 100 Thieves, that is. Dignitas, you know, really only here because they face Team Liquid. I think they would lose to Energy in a best of five. I think they would lose to 100 Thieves in a best of five. I think Team Liquid just has a really bad matchup advantage into Dignitas, and I think they should be able to take advantage of that to get here, but 100 Thieves absolutely should be able to take them down. I would expect this to be a 3-1-3-0. That's my spread in favor of 100 Thieves. And then you've got Cloud9 taking 
on Hunter Thieves once again. Maybe there's an upset, but to me, Cloud9 should be the better of these two teams, just like I said before. The same analysis that I said before, I think, applies here. I would expect JoJo to be better than Quid when the lights matter the most, and I think Hunter Thieves, without the ability to play through mid lane and move stuff around the map, is actually a significantly worse team, and so I would expect Cloud9 to be able to take that series, and that means your Grand Finals, FlyQuest and Cloud9, the two teams that I'm projecting to qualify for MSI, and... I've got Cloud9 winning the LCS split. I know I had FlyQuest beating them in the upper bracket, but I think these two teams are actually pretty evenly matched, and I really wanted to just give some parity. If you wanted to have Cloud9 win both of these series, I think that's more realistic than FlyQuest winning both of these series. I think Cloud9 is the favorites for me to win the LCS title here in spring. I just have to imagine that they're going to figure it out. I know they haven't looked like they're supposed to in the spring split, but the glimpses, the flashes of what they can be have been shown. If they can just get that and lock in and get everybody focused and motivated for an entire playoff run. I do think they should be the best team. FlyQuest is going to be the team that I think contests them the most, and I do think they are clearly, in my opinion, the two best teams in North America with 100 Thieves as a close number three, but I would expect Cloud9 to be the team to hoist the LCS trophy at the end of the year, but let me know if you guys agree or disagree down in the comments. Do you think Cloud9 is going to level up? I guess by the time you're watching this, you probably have a good idea as to whether or not this has aged well or poorly. I've really set myself up for disaster if they get absolutely blown out by 100 Thieves here today, but let me know what you think down in the comment section below. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like. It really does mean a lot to me. Let's me know you guys are enjoying the content, and it does help get this video out to a lot more people, which I'm always very appreciative of. If you're new here, hit subscribe. We don't only post about the LCS. In fact, later today, my NACL uh, final week, the, the last week of the season in the NACL will be covered on this channel. We'll be previewing the playoffs at least a little bit as well in that. So stick around for that. And of course, tomorrow will be LEC. It's going to be a couple of days later than normal because I had to get the LCS and the NACL out with playoffs starting for them. The LEC has to take a little bit of a backseat just this week because they don't have playoffs. They're not quite as gripping in terms of time crunches, but... With all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day. And I will see you all later.